As I speak to you today, um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. I was thinking, uh, sitting in my chair, if this looks like it's the first time we've ever done this, it kind of is. <laughs> uh, we had a service last week, so we had some experience last week with this uh, format and layout and so on. Um, but this week is a slightly different format, slightly different layout because it is Indigenous People Sunday. And the uh, General Synod of the Anglican Church of Canada has designated uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day under the heading Other Major Feasts That Take Precedence Over Sunday. And it may be observed on the Sunday immediately prior to June 21st, which this year falls on the Sunday of the Second Gathering Table. And over the past while, I've been alluding to the understanding that I have, I hope we have, that acknowledgement of establishing this new parish community situated on the traditional territory of the indigenous people of Fort William First Nation has to mean more to us than just formal acknowledgments, has to mean more to us than a few, few uh, greetings on the bulletin cover, uh, once a year day of focus. The realities are complex, so neither do we want to be uh, a time of inappropriate uh, cultural appropriation, uh, something that is one of those fuzzy areas, but there must be more. There must be more of an exploration of the complex relationships in what has become uh, a vastly multicultural community, a country and a world. But not just another academic study, but rather to explore this as a process together in the context of lived relationships. And it's not my place, it's not our place to speak for others. It's not our place to speak for others. I have my story, which is mine to tell, Others have their stories which are theirs to tell or not to tell. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are here together as people of God, those among whom the Creator is still creating a new thing. Together with the Godhead, traditionally acknowledged as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're on a journey to find out how our stories interact, how our stories interact to give rise to a new story or stories, as a gathering of a multicultural, even multiracial community of diversity and unity. And this is an ongoing process that calls us to live what the ancient hymn quoted in the apostolic writing says, to have this mind, to have this attitude, this spirit, this posture, in or among you, that was in Christ Jesus. And the attitude is humility. And that humility comes coupled with deep respect. And I said last week, and I need to say again, that we cannot be a specifically indigenous church because we are not all specifically indigenous people. And so I've used the phrase that we gather here as treaty people, a phrase not without its own sort of complications because the understanding of treaty is itself a complicated affair. We're uh, after all these centuries beginning to figure out. Nevertheless, it's a way of talking about this that seems helpful in a vision in which we take seriously indigenous and non-indigenous people living together, worshiping together, learning from one another. And it's obvious that for most of history, including most of Canadian history and most of Canadian church history, and most of Anglican Canadian church history, that the process has been mostly a one-way road. And that's a direction that has been slow to emerge. But having emerged, there's a direction that's changing. And it's changing the nature of relationship with the realization that to be truly treaty people is at least a two-way street, if not actually a multiplex intersection. Tara Williamson, belonging to the Chimawawan First Nation in Manitoba, the place, uh, one of the places where I began 
this Anglican phase of my ministry, wrote this. It wasn't until I became an adult that I first heard the expression, we are all treaty people. Quite frankly, it blew my mind. I mean, of course I'm a treaty Indian, but it never occurred to me that my neighbors were treaty settlers. But of course, treaties and agreements require at least two parties. How did settlers forget that? How did I forget that? And one of the concerns, of course, is that speaking of everyone being treaty people can be easily misunderstood as another attempt at assimilation. And I say misunderstood because it really doesn't mean that we are all the same. It really doesn't mean that our differences do not matter. Rather, it means that we are together on this journey, in this process of making the road by walking. A unity that not only recognizes differences, but celebrates the very differences amongst us. And indeed, recognizes that the very essential nature of diversity is foundational to our unity. Without diversity, we could have conformity, we could have sameness or some such thing, but not unity. As Christian people, we acknowledge the trinity, the triunity of God, and expressed in complex and convoluted language, that unity of the Godhead does not negate the diversity, nor does the diversity break the unity. One God in trinity of persons. And this reality carries over into the people of God as well. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. By one spirit you were all baptized into one body. In Christ there is neither male nor female, Gentile nor Jew, nor slave nor free. But equally clear, the oneness embraces the diversity. Remember the earliest conflict that's recorded in scripture that led to what is known as the Council of Jerusalem, the whole business about whether Gentiles could actually be children of God. And if they were children of God, did then they have to become Jewish before they became Christians? And all of those kinds of things that went on. There's a body imagery in the scriptures that describe us as the people of God as the body of Christ. The body is not the same. My hands and my ears are not the same. They're different, but they're part of one body. And so Paul describes us as Christian people as very, very different, flourishing in diversity, but yet one people, one body of Christ. We have not historically often got this right. Church and culture during the post-apostolic history of missionary expansion meant very little of existing cultures could be understood or respected. More often, the existing cultures were dismissed, vilified, and suppressed. And despite the provision of the 39 Articles of Religion, one of our foundational documents, for adaptation to uh, local reality and languages, even the Anglican Church has a stained and tainted record of conquest, imposition, rather than humility and respect, that was the attitude of Jesus Christ, to being in the very nature of God, did not think Godhood something to be grasped, but having emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, becoming human, one of us, dying as one of us, not despising the cross. Yet all of this changes slowly. It is changing. It will continue to change. And as we begin this gathering table journey together, this new thing that God is doing among us, we want to begin in a good way. And there are big issues to be addressed, land claims and legal and social matters, economic issues, and a whole host of cultural and race-related concerns, things which we as the people of God need to be aware and to address. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, uh, but Bishop Rod from the Diocese of Capel is riding uh, his bicycle across Canada uh, to raise awareness of reconciliation and the process of reconciliation. And he, unfortunately, he didn't arrive this morning, but he's arriving this evening sometime, we hope, 
in Thunder Bay. And uh, this leg of his journey here, raising awareness of these issues. There are environmental dilemmas that we, as children of the Creator, made in the divine image and likeness, need to understand and need to work through. And there are spiritual dimensions, complex spiritual dimensions, which are still quite divisive and chaotic, and which we, as people of the great mystery, cannot ignore. And it can all feel rather overwhelming, I guess. Perhaps it would all be overwhelming if not for the fact that the Creator has not left us alone to figure it all out. We aren't often very good at listening, but listening is a key discipline and skill for the people of God, whether in the sheer silence where the prophet heard the voice of God, in the voice crying in the wilderness that came to us through scripture and tradition, in the proclamation of good news, the singing of songs of praise and worship, praying, in seeking to love mercy and do justice, let those who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And in doing so, we need to remember that one of the primary ways in which the Spirit speaks to us is through one another, and we need to have ears for one another. And this listening involves, among other things, humility and respect, those things of which we've been speaking. Making the road by walking calls us to be people of humility, walking humbly with our God, and people of respect, as well as people of courage and integrity, which involves truthfulness and, and honesty, people of wisdom. And all of this is rooted in the call to be people of love, people who first come to know and believe ourselves to be beloved. Beloved of God and of one another, as the apostolic writer said, we love because God first loved us. That's the foundational truth of this good news of God in Jesus. And without this, we're just a lot of religious noise, as St. Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers. Without this, we cannot be free, because this is the essential truth that will set us free. Not free by government proclamation, not free by legal, religious, or canonical law. Not free to play act or to think positively or to conform to all sorts of external expectations and controls. But free by knowing and believing that we are deeply, deeply, deeply loved by God. Deeply, wildly, unconditionally loved by Creator, who fashioned us from the earth into the image to live in deep relationship of love with the Creator, to be sharers and stewards of this temple of God that we call the earth with all of our creaturely relatives. And this isn't just a lot of pious cliché, it's not a lot of sentimental feel-good talk. The call to be together, the people of God, the people of Jesus, the people of the Spirit, isn't a Sunday morning religiosity. It's a call to be workers together with Christ in God's mission of recreating, of new creation, of shaping the unformed future, of restoring, renewing, a mission of reconciliation and wholeness that the scriptures call salvation. And it's an invitational call to join the dance of the creator and the creation, to hear the holy drumbeat of life and listen again for the bells of the spirit that help us keep in step with God and with one another, with our relatives, every day of our lives. I forgot the most, the reason why I told the story about Eagle River, I forgot the punchline. The reason that I told that story is that when I danced at the school powwow, one of the boys noticed that I was out of step and he came and gave me his bells. <laughs> so to get me back into to step. And we all need to be in this place in our lives where we listen to the voice of God and to get back into step with the holy dance of God. And so it seemed to me appropriate to ask uh, my wife Nancy 
uh, to lead us in the prayer of dance. 